Pipes trip trapping on the murdered lord's stone. Oren is affectionately unhinged. You don't know when she's going to pop up. You don't know in what form she's going to be. She's incredibly tricksy and uses all of her wiles to to get what she wants. Set my flesh to your unholy purpose! One of the physical aspects that I really wanted to integrate with Orin was her relationship with her blades, her weapons. She has a very intimate relationship with them. They feel real and personified to her. To be considered even in the same realm, much less share scenes with J.K. Simmons and Jason Isaacs, who play General Kethrick Thorm and Gortash, was such an honor, and it was so inspiring and exciting to see their work in this game and experience how our characters come together in the scenes we share to create this unholy, evil triumvirate. His crypt breath sings to my sinews again, 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 again. Oren is a very disturbing figure in Baldur's Gate 3. She really takes the players on quite a journey, so I hope that they sit back and enjoy the ride and let me know all of their terrifying thoughts. <laughs> I'll tell you a story, true soul, about a man who sold himself piece by piece. He had everything, a wonderful wife, a brilliant daughter. They lived not far from here. His wife died too young. Grief tore through their home like a thief snatching away the scent of her hair, the rustle of her skirts. But the man did not break. He could not break. His daughter needed him whole, after all. She grew up, grew strong, challenged him, filled his heart with such joy it supplanted all sorrow. When she was killed, the man, he tried to remain whole. But it wasn't possible. Do you understand? Enver Gortash, swearest thou by Baldurin's blade to defend the citizens of Baldur's Gate from enemies within and without? You are soon to witness the people of Baldur's Gate granting me complete power over them. A new age is upon us. Gods have mercy on those who would stand in our way. A mad dog understands the yank of the leash and the hand of its master, but it cannot be an equal. You can be my equal. There's an old wisdom. A brittle alliance can never be mended. It can only break. I want to lead this city to glory, not scorch its earth. Friends, allies, to my side. Let us usher in a new dawn! This city is mine! I'm not ready to call you enemy. What do you say? Shall we be allies? Cities are incredibly hard to make in RPGs because you have to make sure that every single nook and cranny has something to do. You have to make sure that it's different, so you have to be incredibly creative. Given that the name of the game is Baldur's Gate, the city was really going to be the thing that people were going to be talking about. The city of Baldur's Gate is seamless, which uh, it originally wasn't. You only can judge the game when you have all the components together, and if the mix doesn't work, we start over. At some point, he said, like, can't we just connect everything? And uh, that, was, uh, that was a very interesting day. One of the things that that's done is it's brought a level of believability and immersion uh, and also complexity that wouldn't have been there otherwise. Now it was this seamless, giant organism and it really, really felt good. It's being able to look out of a window and see down the city slopes, so you're seeing down toward the docks, and you're like, one of my teammates might be down there. They might be running around down there. We worked on it uh, as a painting almost. You, you start with a sketch, a very basic line, and then you just start adding layers and layers. We can 
put lots more of the city onto the screen uh, than they could in 1998. So uh, we can do something that is more immersive, richer, has more texture to it. It feels like you are walking around a place where there are lots and lots of people living their actual lives. You have crowds that are walking around, can talk to pretty much anybody, and they react to every single thing. It's, it's very alive in that sense. Every person that you meet in Baldur's Gate uh, has got a story to them. All the things that you have done up to the city really matter. You can really feel the conclusion of everything just gathering there. We actually build anticipation through all these characters that you've met, through all these situations that you've been through. All the stories that you have been following, all the decisions that you've been making, they all come to fruition uh, in that lower city. And the great thing is, if you so choose, you can be another bad thing that's happening to the city. You can arrive and be like, this place is on fire, and then you can throw petrol all over it. During production, we felt like the city was our was our destination. We spent, I think, three times, four times as much effort on the city than we originally planned. But the result, the result, the, the, the feeling of walking in there is just fantastic. You have this constant jostling of things that are very much of the real world, and then you can indulge in the completely fantastical. And then when you walk into the city, the noise of everybody talking to each other, the knowledge that everywhere you look, you can go there and you can do something, the knowledge that you can fly through it, it's great. So the thing that I was the most afraid of when we started making this game turned out to be the thing that I'm the most proud of. <laughs> I know you want to make the perfect game, but this is not the way! This is the way! Behold! The secret sauce of Dungeons and Dragons! So, yeah, anyway, I hope, I really hope we're gonna get it. I don't know if they're gonna be open to it, but uh, we can try, right? We have to try it. Yeah, we have a good pitch, so let's, let's, let's try it out. Hello. Good morning. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Sven. Uh, I'm from Lion Studios together with uh, Gigi. And we're here to see uh, Mike Mills. Why don't you have a seat and I will email it. Okay, thank you. Oh, can I can I take a look? You certainly can. Uh, all these cool stuff, man. Look, this is a, a mind flare. Yeah. Yeah, look at this. Oh, it's a glass of barbecue. Uh -huh. yeah. Oh that's that's convenient. <gasps> look at that. It's an iron flask. Do you know what an iron flask does? Yeah, they use it to trap creatures. Sir, please yeah. don't touch that. Oh, sorry about that, sorry. Uh, oh, it's a beholder. Oh, a beholder. Huh? Cool. Yeah, sorry about that. He's got this thing in his head, so it happens from time to time. What's your business today? Oh, we're here to license Bob's Gate 3. Good luck with that. People have been trying for many years. Oh, really? Yeah, hope you came prepared. Um, I came prepared. I did come prepared. This is the second time that we're putting on the armor, because we managed to put it backwards. Uh, Getting ready for a high-profile meeting with the leadership of Wizards of the Coast. Uh, so hopefully it's going to go well this time. Hi guys! Sven! How's it going? Good, no one told me it was going to be this kind of meeting. Well, I got a special request. Okay. Let me get uh, out my, uh, my deal maker. Well, uh, yeah. Well, you, you don't need that. You uh, don't need the armor. Uh, well, I'd like to license Baldur's Gate 3. <laughs> Why? You need the armor. <laughs> yeah, I think you really need the armor. Really? Uh, what, yeah. what, what is it going to take? This is going to be big. I mean, this is going to be a grand adventure. This okay. Is, it's got to be true to D&D lore. You can't have you just reinventing things while we're not looking. Okay. The players have to feel that their choices matter. It's not, uh, you know, it's not fake choices. It's real, real decisions. Yeah, got it. Player agency. You know, and furthermore, I mean, you know, the creativity, the freedom, the graphics, I mean, just across the board, we're going to need to see just the best version that anyone's ever expected. We set the bar pretty high. Over delivery? Okay. Yeah. And we've got one more requirement. I think we need to really feature the process of seramorphosis in this game. I think if we do that, that will bring everything together and make it a true d, &D experience. Sorry, doses, eh? Seramorphosis. Seramorphosis. Okay. All right. 
All right, well, I think we can do this deal. Shouldn't be a problem. <laughs> All right, yeah. well, it's good. You wanted to do a tour? Let's, Let's do, do the tour. tour. All right, this is it, eh? So here we are. This is the DZ offices are on okay. this floor here. All right, oh, I see the ampersand there. Yeah, it's right on either side. Mm. The security door, if you want to follow me. Yeah, I will. Watch yeah. the mind flare. <laughs> it's the beholder, it's not a mind flare. I have you there. <laughs> nice. Yeah, see, I was testing you. <laughs> I went for the eye. Okay. Some warmer products are over here. Mm, I feel, I, something's missing here. You don't have a Baldur's Gate. Somebody yeah. should be putting a Baldur's Gate there. Yeah, I can know, help you with this. Uh, Baldur's Gate, that's the crown jewel. We don't really want to do anything with it until we know it's the exact right partner in place and the exact right story to tell. We'll see. We'll see. Mm. Now, speaking of mind players, this is really the root of everything that I think is important to you. Right, an amazing monster, a unique piece of lore. What's the yeah. thing in the eye? Can you just point that out? Ah! Okay. Oops. Ah! Can we just... <laughs> How's your day been? Nice to meet you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> huh, construction. Mike! Mike! What, the, what? I need you to tell me everything you know about serotrombosis. Come on. It's seromorphosis. Yes, I'm that not, one. I'm not going to tell you until you can pronounce it correctly. Seromorphosis. This. Okay, it's the process by which a humanoid creature is transformed into a mind flare. And they actually, they, they stick this tadpole thing like right into your eye socket and crawls into your mind. It's really, like, mind flare is one of the most like interesting monsters in Dungeons and Dragons. It actually all goes back to 1974 when the game no, was no, first no, no, no. I don't need a history lesson. I need to know about serotrombosis. No, no, I am. I'm explaining to you. So you understand serotrombosis in the front. It, it, you know, it, it, you're taking mind flayers, capture humanoids, and they transform them to more of their kind. It's this process by which their brains are devoured and then transformed. It's a brutal, horrible experience. A humanoid, anyone who undergoes this process, is destroyed utterly. Only the most powerful magic, maybe a wish spell, can possibly bring them back. And that's how mind flayers make more of their kind. But as I was saying, to understand mind flayers and seromorphous in detail, we have to go back to 1974 and understand the dawn. All right, Mike, you're really good. You know your shit. Okay, so this is what we're gonna do. I'm not gonna let you out just now. I'll take you with me. You're gonna go on a small trip. I promise I'll let you out, but not just right away. Better strap it. Enjoy the ride, Mike. Oh, Bye. Ah. And that is how we got the license to Baldur's Gate 3. Well, more or less. Uh, my name is Sven Pinke. I'm the founder of Larian Studios and the director of Baldur's Gate 3. And I'm so happy we can finally talk about this game because we've been trying to keep this thing a secret for a very long time with the emphasis on trying. And now we don't have to remove all the posters from the walls anymore every single time somebody steps into the office. Uh, we are going to be sharing our development progress in videos like this uh, throughout uh, development, just like we did for Divinity Original Sin 2. Uh, you'll see us uh, show you new features, you'll see us uh, react to your feedback with adaptations to those features, and like this, slowly but surely, we will evolve Baldur's Gate 3 into the bestest and biggest RPG that Larian Studios has ever made. We're working super close with Wizards of the Coast. Uh, they've been spending plenty of time in our offices, and we've been spending plenty of time in their offices. Uh, you can expect from us a grand adventure that's going to be filled with stuff to explore, stuff to experiment with, challenging combat, memorable companions, tough decisions, and much, much, much more. You'll be able to gather your party, play on your own or with friends, and it's going to be incredibly amazing. If you want to stay informed on what's going on in the world of Baldur's Gate 3, be sure to sign up for the Learning Gazette. It's the thing that's going to replace our Kickstarter updates, and it's where we're going to be posting all of our development updates. 
That's it for me. Thank you for watching. I hope to see you uh, very soon. Uh, let us know what you think of the announcement. Let us know what you think of the teaser trailer. Post your suggestions and questions, and we'll do our best to respond. Take care, and until next time. Bye-bye. Ta-da! -da! <laughs> Hi, everybody, and welcome to community update number three for Baldur's Gate 3. I have great news today. We finally locked down our early access content, and we decided that we're going to bring Baldur's Gate 3 for the very first time in your hands in August. 2020. That's to say, maybe. And the maybe has everything to do, of course, with COVID-19. We've been hit like everybody else in the world. We've been working from home, which wasn't necessarily the easiest thing as game developers, because we like to huddle around the monitor and discuss about the things that are happening in the game. But nonetheless, we managed to make a lot of progress since you last saw the game at PAX East. So we think we're going to make it, depending on a couple of things. One of these things, for instance, is our performance capturing and motion capturing. Our people have started to returning to the office. We've been uh, recording again. And if we can hit a certain speed in the recording, then we should be able to make it. The game is looking amazing. It is absolutely incredible to see how much progress has been made since PAX East. And I think when you'll see it, you'll understand what I'm talking about. Uh, the visual fidelity has increased a lot. And the cool part is that actually uh, we're going to launch a game in August in early access, but we still have an entire development period to go after that. So it's going to look even better by the time it's going to release. Uh, you will see things like improvement in combat. Uh, we did a lot of changes in how combat flows, how the camera moves, uh, how the initiative system works. Uh, the, all together they make for a much more refined combat experience, which is a lot of fun, I can tell you that. There are changes in the way that we do our narrator. That was something that we had a lot of feedback on. Uh, there's uh, the integration of the rule set is getting better and better, so we were getting a really good handle on how to do things, and so it feels like a, a really, really cool game with a lot of depth. Get out of my head! Here's the really cool part. You don't have to wait until August 20 to 20 to see what I'm talking about because we'll do another gameplay live stream and we'll do it just in front of Dungeons and Dragons Live on June 18th. And you will decide for me whether or not I'm going to do, kill a hobgoblin who deserves to be killed, his name is Dror Raxin, or if I'm going to descend into the Underdark. I'm very much looking forward to it, so I hope to see you there on June 18th. It's going to be a lot of fun. Take care, bye-bye. Hello. Hi, David. Uh, this is David, he's the producer of Original Sin, and we'll show you the game uh, together today. So, if you're playing in multiplayer, that means that Damien and I can disagree off-screen, but also on-screen. Hey, there's a talking shell here. Really? <laughs> yeah, really. I think you should sell it. But no, you should sell it. Okay, so if you aren't in disagreement like this uh, when you have to make a decision, the game checks and calculates who wins the discussion. And in this case, Sven won. Ah, I'm happy that we're doing this again, David. What? Doing what? Well, playing multiplayer. It's been a long oh, time. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's always fun. Hey, what did you do with the shell? What the shell? End? Come on, the shell. Oh, yeah, that silly thing. Yeah, I just sold it. I yeah. always wondered about that, actually. Oh, I got a, I got a scene here uh, with us, the intellect of horror. Uh, us? Yeah, haven't you seen this? Oh, hold on, you, you're going to love this. Let me show you. There's, there's really a lot of options here, so... One second. All right, check it out. Ooh. All right, yeah. I mean, okay, so what do you want us to do? I could do the Githyanki thing, destroy it, but there's also other stuff that I can do. What do you think? Nah, you are a Githyanki, so if you roleplay it, you could... What are you doing here? What's he doing here? Big dexterity. But why? No, he's a no, Githyanki. I'm no, I'm a Githyanki. Well, but yeah, maybe. So, I think that we should... Come on! Hey, do the Kitwa. No! All right, well, that settles it. It's, good. it's always the same problem, eh? Yeah. It's like, we need to solve this, you know? Yeah, they're always barging in, telling us what to do. I think we need, I think we need a vote system. A voting system yeah. and dialogues. Yeah. And that we bring some. We could also use it online. Oh, when I you're streaming, oh. you can ask your audience, what would you do? Let's vote. Oh my god, oh my god. Let's do this. Yeah. <laughs> Feature buttons, one, two, three. You can push on the button. It's not even blue. I see there's no blue thing, so do I get the hammer? Then where's the single? I mean, Oh, <laughs> It's done. Oh, brilliant. It's finished. It is. It's glorious. It's gonna, yeah, it's gonna work. <sighs> yeah. Now, 
someone's going to have to tell Jason. And you know what? That's exactly what we did. But about two years ago, we told Jason Latino, our cinematic director, what our ambitions were with Baldur's Gate 3 for both single player and multiplayer cinematics. And he came up with some fantastic solutions. We have an interview with Jason, so I suggest we have a look at that and then I'll be back. Uh, I'm Jason Latino, cinematic director here at Larian Studios. Uh, we're in the Dublin office. Um, this is where uh, both the writing team is uh, centrally located uh, along with cinematics. So we're determining in this office like what story we're telling and how we're telling the story, which is taking that camera down from being above the players um, and, and right into the drama and right into the action. Say it. You think I'm a monster? We've come up with a system that allows uh, voting, that allows uh, kind of seeing um, uh, uh, other players' preferences for what I would do uh, in that scenario. You might be learning secrets, you might be uh, uh, finding out about a weapon cache somewhere or uh, a certain mission that you want to do on your own. The fact that you're suddenly observed is information you need to know as the player um, uh, and presenting that in a cinematic way is, is what my whole department is doing. Baldur's Gate is an absolutely huge game. Uh, I, don't, I can't think of an, another early access game that's done cinematics uh, on this level, that has deliberately chosen to, to present their story in close-up like this. Uh, there's a lot of games where the moment you add cinematics, they have to get smaller because they have to, you, there's animations and, and all the, the, the manual work that goes into this stuff. Uh, we didn't want to do that. We don't want to limit the, the stories that, I don't want to be the guy that showed up and limit the stories that, that Larian's telling. So we're working on uh, some adaptive cameras that work the same way if you're a half elf or if you're a half ling. And we want you, if, uh, if you're playing a gnome, for that story to be told from your perspective. We want that to be cinematic. We want you to feel like you're telling your story and we're shooting it for you. If you're walking around and you see one of your, your, your buddies is engaged in dialogue, that means they are seeing a cutscene, that they, they, they have blinders on. Uh, and this is something that kind of goes back with uh, uh, the, the kind of uh, the Larian tradition of being able to, to pickpocket people that are kind of engaged in social activities and sequences. Uh, and so you can pickpocket your friends, you can pickpocket the person they're talking to, uh, you can move around dynamic objects and woohoo! <laughs> Pickpocket them. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Petal. My, my. The mask suits you. But later on, if you choose to play a Starian or a vampire, you might wake up in the middle of the night uh, kind of looking for a midnight snack. Uh, you know, the, the menu, the dialogue options, the way that you can take that scene is basically going to be a list of your friends or party members. Uh, if you're playing multiplayer, that's going to be a list of, of, of the guys that you're playing with. Uh, and what's great about that is not only are they on the menu for that night, uh, they're going to see that. And they're going to see that they're on the menu. And through the kind of the voting mechanic, uh, they're going to be able to say, this is like, no, 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 OK, I'll, I'll, I'll give one up for the team. Or they can try and sell at their buddies and just say, no, no, bite him, bite him. Uh, so that's, that's a way that like, there's that dramatic irony that uh, uh, we're able to play on and we'll be looking for more ways to experiment with uh, as we develop the game uh, because uh, 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 taking on multiplayer uh, cinematics is something that hasn't really been done. It's typically you'll have a multiplayer game with cinematics and they, they're, but they're consumed basically the same. All I want is a little fun. Is that so much to ask? Uh, uh, and what's, what, what we want to do is, is take that one step further and actually this is like, well, your friends are seeing that you're seeing this as well. And they're putting their vote on, they can try and sell their friend out. They can say, don't eat me, or just like, no, bite me. Uh, uh, and so they're, but they, they don't have control over the situation. Uh, so there's that, that, that fine kind of dramatic irony that you get in this game with our multiplayer cinematics, and we're always gonna be looking for more opportunities to do this. Uh, that's just one that we're wrenching in currently. Stop! I give up! Uh, you know, it's an experiment. It's, there's not many uh, 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 kind of narrative experiences of that kind. Uh, cinematics is typically you watch a movie versus participate in it. Uh, and uh, even though there are other games that allow you to, to choose where the story goes, there are very few games that allow you to do that in concert with your friends and through multiplayer. So developing those scenes, figuring out when we're trying this, what works and what doesn't, um, uh, throwing stuff out, adding things in, mutating, rewriting, 
uh, reshooting. That's, that's, that's an organic process that we all get to do together. That's what early access is all about, is figuring out what has impact with you guys, what has resonance, uh, and how we can surface that more in the way that we choose to do our work. And that is just the dialogues in the multiplayer. There is so much more to the multiplayer version of Baldur's Gate 3 that you have to uh, experience it to believe it. Uh, for example, uh, in combat, when uh, it is your turn and it is another player's turn at the same time, you can now simultaneously command your uh, party and have them do things and uh, have them interact with each other, actually. Uh, which leads to a lot of uh, discussion, obviously, but is also a lot of fun. Likewise, uh, if you're a streamer, you can, at any moment that you want, give control of your dialogues to your audience and then you will see what they voted for. And I think it's going to lead to a lot of very, very interesting adventures. Uh, we have more, but it's not all of it is ready because the game is still in development and we're just preparing for early access. But once the early access campaign will be rolling, we are going to introduce multiplayer feature after multiplayer feature. And obviously we're going to listen to what you have to tell us and then we'll add those things on top of it also, at least if they're doable. Uh, that's it for me today. Uh, we are going to be back with a new community update and that, in that one we're going to tackle the topic of romance in Baldur's Gate 3. See you soon, take care, bye bye. his brains again. I guess I know who's responsible for dinner tonight. Well, what's wrong with brains, Sven? I don't know. I mean, like, brains yesterday, the day before that, ever since we started on this project. Brains, brains, brains. I didn't even want to eat brains in the first place, let alone this many times. Even a dog is tired of brains. Well, we can eat a dog. No, you can't eat a dog. You gotta pet the dog. I'm not trusting you anymore with the responsibility of finding food for our party. It's over. Well, you knew I was a rogue. You can never trust me. Speaking of trust, this brings us seamlessly <laughs> to the theme of our community update today. Today, we're going to be talking about romance and relationships in Baldur's Gate 3 and building up trust in your party. And joining me to explain you how we do things in BG3 are Sarah Bayliss, our lead writer, and Jason Latino, our cinematic director. We did a big interview with them, so I suggest we have a look at what they have to say. For example, you have someone like Gail who needs to consume magical artifacts in order to survive. He's got this... I don't think I'm supposed to say that. Never mind, that's a spoiler. <laughs> okay. Uh, when you meet the characters in this game, they're not just sitting there waiting for the player character to happen upon them, really. They have their own motivations, their own reason to be there, um, their own history. And when the player meets them, they have an opportunity to form a party that has a shared goal. I'm with you. Blackith blesses me this day. Uh, so the group that we're traveling with um, under normal circumstances, would never ever have anything in common, have any reason to travel together. Um, you have a Githyanki warrior, you have a folk hero of the Blade of Frontiers, you have a cleric of Shar, you have a wizard that wants nothing more than to be in his tower studying wizardly things. Um, but they're kind of forced into this situation where their best chance of survival is going to be to rely on each other. But that doesn't change the fact that under normal circumstances they've got next to nothing in common. And the question is going to be, is this shared goal going to be enough to keep them together or are their differences going to tear them apart? A sharp tongue, elf. Would that your mind proved its equal. Half elf. So because your party is made up of these extremely different people who would normally never be associated or have a group together, there's going to be plenty of conflict, particularly um, at your camp when they have a moment to reflect on what's been happening, what decisions you've made that might have favored one of your fellow travelers over another, that's all going to kind of come to a head at some point. And it can even happen that one character might not survive a particular conflict depending on how you decide to settle it. 
The relationships that you have with your companions are not solely defined by the specific things you say to them in a one-on-one -on -one conversation. Um, if I'm traveling with Shadowheart, she's always gonna be observing the decisions that I'm making, who I choose to fight, who I choose to spare. So everyone in your party is always gonna be watching you, um, seeing how you interact, and uh, forming their own judgments about you based on that. Your camp is the place that, as you're going through your adventure, you can always kind of get your bearings, talk to the people you've been traveling with, um, have a moment to reflect on everything that's been happening. And in these kind of quiet moments are where the conflict comes to the top. You have a moment of silence and safety and it's gonna bubble up there. Um, not only conflict as well, you might have a relationship developing with someone that you're traveling with. And in this kind of quiet moment around the campfire is when you're gonna have a chance to explore that and get to know them a bit better, or maybe they'll come to you and say they've been noticing you or really impressed by something you've done, and the camp is the kind of moment where that's gonna to come to a head as well. I want you to know that I like what I see. In short, I've grown to trust you. Um, so we put a lot of time and effort into making our companions and origin characters as kind of nuanced as possible, but at the end of the day, this remains a D&D game, and the most important character in a game of D&D is you, the player, who you want to be, um, what kind of character you want to create. And um, we tried really hard to make sure that a customized character is not missing out on anything in the game world. They still have layers to discover about themselves and mysteries to unfold. A drow in the sun! Stand down! This one's got a touch of the absolute about her. So with Dungeons and Dragons, we're all telling a story together. Uh, uh, part of telling a three-dimensional story is, is romance. So what we have to look at is we have to look at uh, the, the scenes that the writers are giving us, uh, the, the, the rules of the game, um, the, all the different uh, races and classes and stories that the players can tell, um, and the romance options, and make that all feel real to them and make that feel authentic to the player. You know who I never thought I'd find myself caring for? Um, uh, here we have like Shadowheart and the player getting to know each other uh, over a bottle of wine uh, while they watch the stars come out over the skies of Faerun. Um, this is something that is, it's not written explicitly into the script, but it's something that uh, the, the writers allow us to adapt into, into cutscenes uh, and uh, figure out how we can arrange the characters so they're closer to each other. When are they looking at each other? When are they looking away from each other? When are they staring into their bottle of wine, um, wondering what to say next? When are they fumbling for words? Uh, uh, you know, this is, this is something that comes up with you when you have a dialogue UI. And it's, it's, it's analogous to getting to know somebody for the first time and choosing your next words wisely. Uh, because in a game like this, uh, the, what you say dictates what these relationships can turn into, how far can they go, how much do you learn about these characters, and uh, just generally what shape a relationship is going to take. I must admit, you've been a surprise, and not an unpleasant one. There are other more intimate moments that we film here as well. Uh, uh, we use storyboards to onboard the actors, onboard uh, the art team, in order to figure out uh, uh, what's going to happen, uh, what needs to be captured live in the camera, what needs to be present in the data, um, as well as letting the actors know how we're going to use that data, how we're going to present their performance to the audience. So when you're working with the, the, the player's guide from Dungeons and Dragons, you have uh, all of these different races at all these different sizes, uh, uh, action scenes, romance scenes, they all have to work for whatever the player chose to, uh, chose as their race. We have to consistently honor their choices. We have to say, it's just like, no, you're a halfling hero. Uh, uh, there's, no, there's no problem that's too big for you. Um, nope, nope, don't do that, don't do that. No matter who you are, no matter uh, uh, what story you're telling, uh, romance can be a big part of your journey, and we're here to make that feel real. And there you have it. Now, just like the characters that Jason and Sarah are trying to bring to life are looking for a way of getting rid of the tadpole that's gonna turn them into mind flayers, we at Laren Studios are working very hard trying to get that early access version in your hands. 
Whether the party is going to succeed of getting rid of thermorphosis and everything that that entails, we don't know. But what we do know is that we are about ready and it should be in your hands very, very, very soon. And with that said, this is probably one of the last community updates before the early access release. So thank you very much for watching. See you very, very soon. We can't wait to hear what you think of Baldur's Gate 3 and I look very much forward to hearing all of your feedback. Take care, everybody. Until next time. Bye bye. Hi, everybody, and welcome to community update number 11 for Baldur's Gate 3. We just released patch 3 today, and it features a whole bunch of things that address feedback that you've been sending us via Reddit, via Steam, via our own forums. We looked at them and we started making changes to the game, and today you are going to see the first rollout of a whole bunch of these changes. A bold statement, if not an accurate one. Uh, we started making our companions a little bit more tolerant. We noticed that you didn't like Shadowheart nitpicking about every single little thing that you did, or Lysel telling you, you can't do that, you can't do that, you can't do that. So what we did is we made them more tolerant, we focused more on the positive sides, but they still will have very strong reactions whenever you're going to do something that they feel strongly about. I will never understand your kind. Uh, the second thing we did is we looked at how DC's uh, difficulty checks were handled in the game. We changed our strategy a little bit, so you will have less catastrophic failures. And if you have a failure, like you rolled a one, for instance, as happens so often to me, uh, what you're going to be able to do is you're going to get a second chance. This is something that a dungeon master would do around the table, and we figured that at these really key moments in the game, it would be important that we also let you have a second chance. Same as the drow. But Master Halson said he'd turn eventually. If you failed that second check, there's still going to be hope for you because we fixed the inspiration UI also. So now you're going to see exactly how much inspiration points you have. And there's a handy little tutorial that's going to explain you how they work. We also gave you now the option of getting experience for bypassing combat. So in the past, if you persuaded somebody not to kill you, you wouldn't get experience points. But now you're actually going to get experience points, which is pretty cool. We've removed the surfaces, the surfaces from cantrips uh, like uh, Firebolt or Acid Splash or uh, Ray of Frost. So those cantrips are not going to create uh, eye surfaces or acid surfaces anymore. You will still get surfaces from casting the spells, but not on the cantrip. Uh, we also uh, made it so that now if you go to rest, if you take a short rest, you will get two short rests per long rest. So it's not limited to one short rest per long rest anymore. This is going to be obviously very beneficial for character classes like uh, the Warlock. One of the things that we did that's going to be very welcomed, I think, is that uh, whenever you get a level two or level three spell, you can now upcast them uh, directly from your UI. So you just have to click on the button, select if you want to cast it at level one, level two, and you're going to get uh, that spell cast at the correct level. Another thing that we did is that whenever you jump over a chasm, your followers or party members are going to jump automatically over it also. That is going to heavily reduce the amount of clicks you need to overcome like really complicated obstacle parkours. And like this, there's been many improvements. There's a lot of fixes also. There's a lot of more stability, performance optimizations that were done. Uh, lots of polish. You'll see better lighting, better cinematics, etc. So quite a lot of work, uh, but that's not where it's going to end. Uh, because after patch 3, there will be patch 4, which we plan now somewhere after the holidays. And in patch 4, you can expect quite a lot of, of bigger things being added and more feedback of the community being integrated into the game. Unfortunately, uh, this patch breaks save game compatibility. Uh, it had to happen eventually. Uh, we started making changes in the story, adapting to the way that you guys have been playing. Also making changes that we needed to do to anticipate certain things later in the game. And so we can't make that work with existing save games. However, fear not. If you were engaged in like a really long campaign and you wanted to continue playing with your existing save games, you can because we allowed you to go back to another branch and you can use your existing save games. Mind you, they're not going to be compatible with anything going forward, but you can still continue on your existing save games and finish that EA content if that's a thing you want to do. And if you want to know exactly how to do that, just go to the patch notes. It will explain to you in detail how you can access your previous branches. That said, thank you. Once again, for playing Early Access, the game has been a huge success for us. Uh, we are getting an incredible amount of feedback. We've compiled over 100 pages of things to do. We're now in the process of executing all of those things. It will take us several months, uh, but the net result is going to be a much, much better game. And that, of course, is the reason why we are in Early Access. Thank you very much, take care everybody, and see you very soon for the next patch. Hello everybody, my name is Sven Vinke, I am the director on Baldur's Gate 3, and I'm gonna talk you through today uh, all of the cool things that we've added to BG3 uh, in patch five. So let's get started.
one of the highlights for me of patch 5 is the inclusion of what we call the active role system. Uh, how does it work? Well, it's very simple. Whenever there's a check that pops up, uh, you can actually ask your character to cast a spell to aid fate a little bit. So for instance, here you can see me cast Guidance and that's going to give me a 1 to 4 bonus on the roll that I need to do. But you could also ask one of the other party members in your vicinity to cast a spell to aid your luck a little bit. And like this, you can stack them and that can make a very big difference in gameplay. To give you an example, I was playing the game uh, earlier today and uh, I was uh, accessing the chapel. There's a, a lockpick check that you can do there. And usually that fails because it has a very high uh, DC number. It has a 20, uh, which you need to match. That's very high. Uh, but with the aid of my cleric, uh, Shadowheart, I managed actually to open that door, something that I hadn't managed without cheats in a long time. And so I discovered a completely different way of entering that chapel, and I was very happy to see also that our scripters and the writers had anticipated all of that, and I had a completely different entry point to my adventure. So be sure to try out the active role when you download Patch 5. You're going to find that it does quite a lot of good things. Hit me! Go! Ah. Hello. Next up is actually a pretty big feature, uh, which is the background goals. When you create a character in the game, you get to pick a background. So you get to be a folk hero, for instance, or a noble. Well, say that you pick folk hero and you do something that a folk hero would do in the game, then the game is going to reward you with an inspiration point or with some experience if you already are at your inspiration cap, which is actually also a new thing. Uh, but you're going to find that there's over a hundred of these goals that were added in the content of Early Access for you to discover. And every single time you're going to discover one of them, you're going to see them listed up here in this neat, handy background goal uh, UI that was added to the game. It rises from the stone, hanging in the air in silent offering. Something that you have been asking us for and something that we actually were planning for quite some time is the ability to free Shadowheart in the tutorial. Uh, in the past you couldn't free her, but now you can. You don't have to, it's up to you what you do with it, but you can free her and you'll notice that that introduced a whole bunch of new permutations to the story as you'll try out to play the early access content. You're alive. We also added something that was also a very big community ask and which took quite some effort to do because we're trying to do it right. Uh, it is what we call the point and click system. It's very simple. Whenever you're going to click somewhere, your uh, characters are now going to say something, just like they did in the original games. Uh, so, for instance, if I ask Shadowheart to walk somewhere, she'll say this. I must keep going. But if I ask her to go into sneak mode, she'll say this. Unseen as I was taught. Now the really cool part about this is that they will change what they say in function of where you are in the story and where you are on their character arcs, depending on what decisions you made. Uh, for early access alone, we actually recorded for each of them over 800 uh, voice bars. And we're going to be recording much more as we finish, obviously, the entire thing. Need to keep focused. Uh, by popular demand, we split up the uh, jump and disengage. This was in the past, uh, jumping equal disengaging. Now we have a separate disengage action and jump. It's its own uh, thing. Uh, and this is popular demand also from the community. Uh, you can now break concentration. There's a little uh, icon there that you can click on whenever a character is concentrated, if you want to break their concentration. If you are a pacifist player, you don't necessarily need to kill everybody anymore. Uh, you can just toggle the uh, non-lethal attacks. If you then start smacking them, you're going to knock them unconscious. So you can still rob them blind, but you don't have to kill them. It's better for your karma. Mini camps, mini camps, mini camps is super cool. Okay, so mini camps is essentially the feature that uh, when you go to sleep somewhere, the background setting of your camp is going to match the place where you go to sleep. Remember how in the past when you go to sleep you were always in the wilderness, always with the forest background? Well, no more, because if you now go to sleep into the underdark, you're going to be in the underdark. If you go to sleep into the chapel, you're going to be in the chapel. You go to sleep in the cavern, guess what? You're going to be in the cavern. It's fantastic. It really adds a lot to the immersion of your adventure. It took a lot of work because we had to modify all of the cinematics to be able to take place wherever you were, but it was definitely worth it. So it adds a lot uh, to the gameplay. You did it! You're channeling the weave! Speaking of camp again, uh, there's a couple of extra cinematics that you'll find in camp. Uh, definitely check out uh, Scratch and the Owlbear if you ever figure out how you can get and the dog and the Owlbear cup into your camp. It's possible. 
uh, then you're going to have a very adorable scene as uh, Baldur's Gate 3 continues to improve its pet simulating skills. Uh, we've added a new feature that we want to try out during early access and it's called Camp Resources. So uh, what it means, if you go to sleep now, uh, you're going to be asked what you want to eat. And if you eat sufficient, you're going to have a very fruitful rest and you're going to restore all of your spell slots and all of your HP if you are, for instance, a wizard. However, if you don't have enough supplies, you will have what we call a shallow rest and you're going to be able to restore everything. The reason we did it is because we want to differentiate stronger between short rest and long rest. And so we're very curious to see how it's going to play for you. So do let us know what you think of our camp supplies system. It definitely adds a lot to finding food in the world. And uh, you will notice that as you continue playing the game, uh, the uh, cost of uh, going to rest is going to increase uh, as you level up. Uh, and that actually reflects the, the, the growing upkeep of your ever increasing uh, camp in the game. So very curious to see uh, what you're going to do with that. And we'll fill your front with arrows. Or you turn around and your backside gets the same treatment. A strange symbol glows, marked on their flesh, and something within you stirs in response. And there is a lot more. Now, I'm not gonna go through the list of everything, uh, there's just too much, uh, but I do wanna share a story uh, with you of how uh, this patch changed my own gameplay experience, and I was really happy with what I saw. Uh, so, uh, I already mentioned to you that uh, using my active role, I actually managed to open that chapel door, something which I hadn't done in a long time. Uh, so I went inside, and as I went inside, uh, I had uh, some traps to deal with, and I had a little fight that I needed to do. And then I went to sleep, and uh, as I went to sleep, I had enough supplies, so I ate my supplies. Uh, and I was super happy to see that I was actually standing inside of the chapel as I went uh, to sleep rather than being in that wilderness. It just felt right. And then when I walked outside of the chapel and I surprised those bandits that are there, something that you usually don't see because typically you would go from the other side and just meet the bandits in their normal default script setting, uh, they reacted to it. Uh, I saw a scene that I hadn't seen in a long time. There was a guy yelling at me, hey, somebody's coming out of the crypt. And I was feeling like, hey, this is how it should be. It's a small thing, but it was important to me. So I wanted to share it with you because this is uh, essentially the incremental nature of development. Things are starting to come together and as they're starting to come together, we can start seeing the light at the end of the tunnel of development where the game eventually is going to be released, hopefully somewhere in 22. Uh, that's it for me today. Uh I can read your mind. I know what you are thinking. Where the hell is he? Why is he wearing a different shirt? Why did his face change? Did his hair change? Well, as it turns out, uh, we forgot to record the outro to our little update. And that's why we decided to record a new one here at the Ravenstein in Ghent uh, as we are preparing for panel from hell number three. Uh, before I go and I say goodbye, uh, I wanted to let you know also, we are already hard at work on patch six. So that's going to be coming faster than you think. And uh, of course, we're also hard at work on finishing the entire game. That's going to take a little bit longer, but it is going to come eventually. And when it's going to come, it's going to be, I think, pretty good. All right. Thank you very much for watching. Take care, everybody. Until next time. Sven! Sven! There's an update. Sven? Sven? Have you guys seen Sven? There's an update. Oh, okay. Sven? 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 Ah! Who are you? Um, a doctor. Okay, and where is Sven? Sven's incapacitated at the moment. A look of concern grows over the healer's face. He clearly suspects you're suffering the early effects of seromorphosis. What was that? Now he just thinks you're weird. Uh, uh, oh, you've got a parasite in your brain, and it must be removed. But first, according to the official apothecary health and safety protocols, we'll have to, to test your memory. Tell me, what do you still remember of the last 18 months? I have to, I have to leave. No, I'm going.
Memories wash over you as the worm burrows into the lobe responsible for producing quality promotional videos. Suddenly, a trailer materializes in your mind's eye, fully formed. the nine hells we've added a lot of great stuff already and there's more where that came from so join us in early access on our journey to Baldur's Gate 3 or come along in 2023 when the game releases thanks doc wait wait no 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 wait you're you're you're